So this is the webinar isolation series, which we'll be doing uh, every day at one o'clock. We also run an 11 o'clock session. You feel free to drop in for that. That's uh, guided towards Australia, but the one o'clock session uh, is for your local information. All right, so what is concrete injection? It's a, it's a method of repairing uh, concrete and rock defects where we inject resins and cementitious fluids into the structure, so into cracks and voids. And the resin fills that gap and seals against either air or water. So we use pumps and liquids to, to combine to repair structures, essentially. The type of um, products we can use would be, you may have come across polyurethane resins, uh, epoxy resins, acrylate gels, microfine cements, which have you know, particles of cement in them, so they're not purely a new Newtonian fluid, uh, bentonite and silicates are the different types. And we'll talk about how you can use each of those um, depending on the situation you have in front of you. So where we use this uh, type of technology, as you can see there in the photo, you know, cracked concrete, we use it to repair leaking slabs, walls of underground structures, uh, underground piles and permanent shoring, to stop water coming in, groundwater coming in, tunnels and basements, bridges and car park decks, in other words, dry structures as well, we can apply this technology to, and ground engineering for trying to change the properties of soils and um, strata so that you can achieve different outcomes. So there's been a lot of material advancements over the last few decades. I've personally been involved with uh, injection resins for nearly 30 years now. And what I've seen is that the uh, resins have um, advanced in a way that allows them to use them much more efficiently than we have been able to previously. So the, the resins themselves, the viscosity has come down. So we have much lower viscosities, which means that they can penetrate into structures and um, rock defects much more easily. We have faster reaction times, which means we can stop water more effectively. Instead of using three components and complex pumps and whatever, we can actually use a single component product now in many cases where we can just pump it in through a, a diaphragm pump rather than having multiple components coming together, having to be mixed and applied. So it's becoming much easier to use these products and the chemicals themselves are becoming much safer as well. So less toxins, um, more user friendly. Um, so a lot of advancements over the last 20 or 30 years. And we'll talk about how that helps in each situation. But first, um, we're going to get kind of a little bit off topic um, in terms of the injection itself. We're going to talk about concrete and the crack types because I think it's really important to understand the type of defect you're looking at before you repair it um, because that will determine your repair methods and the type of materials that you might use. So bear with me on this. I'm going to run you through it. It might seem a little bit dull and, and boring, but it's really important information and, and you'll see why as we come to the end of it. So cracking in concrete, all concrete is actually designed to crack. Um, when we design concrete, I'm a structural engineer, we actually design it so that it cracks and you have the steel reinforcement which then holds it all together and takes the tension. Uh, usually there are limits on the amount of cracking, so for water retaining structures, we might have a limit of 0.1 millimetre width on the, on the crack. Um, for general structures, we'd have 0.3 millimetres. And even though you've got that crack there, you're still maintaining an alkaline environment within that crack and around the steel, and you end up with that steel being protected from corrosion because of that alkaline environment. And as long as the pH remains above about 10.5 or thereabouts, then the steel won't corrode. And as long as we're not replenishing oxygen and water into that crack, then the steel won't corrode. Cracks below 0.1 millimetre width are generally not visible. That's an important um, thing to, to recognise. And um, cracks can be defined as either dead um, or live, which means that they're, they're moving constantly if they're live, or if they're dead, they're formed, and they're then steady, so they're not moving. And again, knowing the type of crack will help us determine whether it's a dead or a live crack, and then it'll help us determine which type of resin we might use. So let's start with structural cracking. Um, and when I say structural cracking, this can be structural crack cracking that's not planned for or structural cracking that is planned for. Um, as I said, concrete is designed to crack. So pretty much all concrete members or most concrete members, particularly ones in bending, will have some form of cracking in them. And it's just a question of whether they're within the limits that are acceptable or not within the limits. So cracking occurs where tension is applied. And you can see on that photo there at the bottom of the beam, that beam's in bending. 
So it means that the top half of the, the beam is actually in compression and the bottom half is in tension. So you can see someone's marked with a texture there where those cracks are, just to highlight them a little bit more. You can see those cracks propagating from the bottom of the beam, coming up to around the midsection, which is the neutral axis where you transfer from tension to compression. They're very evenly spaced and patent. So that's a feature of structural cracks. Rarely are they through the entire structure unless it's a pure tension member. So you can see there that it only goes halfway through. From the bottom of that, you wouldn't actually see that. So if you're looking from underneath that beam and you saw cracks, you wouldn't know that those cracks only go halfway through. That's why it's really important to know that these are structural cracks because then that's the sort of thing you'll look for, which will determine the type of repair method you use. So. Another feature of that, because they're narrowing towards the centre, they're, they're variable width. So they're wider at the surface. And what you may see when you're looking up is a, let's say a 0.5 millimetre crack, but in the, at the neutral axis, it'll be zero. So it means the crack is narrowing through to the centre. So again, that'll determine the type of repair method you use um, and where you're pointing the injection towards. So they're the important features of structural cracking and things to keep in mind. Drying shrinkage cracking, um, pretty common. Uh, type of crack. Mostly you'll see these occurring within the first few weeks of casting. Uh, so it occurs because moisture is lost um, during the curing and evaporation process and the concrete uh, usually shrinks and, and we have volumetric change um, to the concrete. The cracks are usually random in direction and spacing, so a bit unlike structural cracks. Uh, you'll see them maybe forming a larger map pattern or being across a corner which is pulling away from a restrained um, part of it. Um, but they usually do pass through the entire cross section. So what you see at the top and in that photo you'll see the top of those cracks because it's restrained and the concrete is shrinking backwards that crack will pass right through the cross section usually at the same thickness um, width all the way through. And it usually occurs due to structural restraints. So columns and walls will hold part of the structure back and the concrete will shrink back towards that and crack. And then just going back to that, um, they're usually dormant, those cracks. They occur you know, during those first few weeks and then they're not moving after that. Plastic shrinkage cracking, again, this is a, a dormant or a dead crack. Um, it occurs prior to the initial set. It's usually due to a lack of water. So the evaporation rate of the moisture in the concrete um, is actually happening faster than the bleed rate. So the water on the surface is actually evaporating off before that moisture can evaporate through the surface. Less common in Singapore because you have such high humidity, but when you're in some really dry environments, um, particularly southern parts of Australia, for example, where you have very dry air, then the evaporation, particularly with a little bit of crosswind, can occur very fast, and that'll cause that surface of the concrete to dry out and you get that map cracking. And it can also occur because of poor placement and overworking. Again, these are dead cracks. Plastic settlement cracking uh, usually occurs, you can see in the photo over the top of the reinforcement, you can see that reinforcement mesh pattern uh, coming through there. They appear within the first 24 hours of casting, usually because of segregation. So if the concrete has been dropped from a height when they're placing it, then the aggregate can separate out from the paste and you end up with more aggregate in the bottom and only cement paste in the top. And that cement paste obviously has more shrinkage than what the aggregate locked um, concrete does. Um, it can also occur because of over vibration. So when they're vibrating the concrete, the aggregate can all settle to the bottom. You end up with a more dense um, concrete at the bottom of the slab than you do at the top. And again, you get that crack just opening up over the top of the reinforcement. So usually those cracks are, they're, they're dead cracks. So they're dormant and they're sitting over the top of the reinforcement, variable width, and really only that 30 or so millimetres of depth down to the reinforcement. Thermal shrinkage cracking. This is a really common uh, type of cracking, particularly in thick um, structural elements. When you pour large volumes of concrete, it gets quite hot because of the exothermic reaction that's occurring um, as the concrete is curing. It gets hot and it can reach temperatures up to 80 degrees. And then it sets at that high temperature and it becomes hard at that high temperature. Then over a period of a few days, it cools down again. And as it's cooling down, the concrete will shrink and contract. And as it's contract, it might be restrained. As it is in that photo, it's restrained by the base slab that it's sitting on. And what happens is the cracks will then propagate um, off that base slab and up the walls. And that propagation of the cracks will occur over the first few days of casting as the concrete cools. And typically what you might see is about a millimetre 
per meter of shrinkage for every 10 degree of cooling, which is quite a lot when you think about it. I mean, if you have a, a 20 meter long structure and it cools by 30 or 40 degrees, that's a lot of shrinkage that's occurring in that element um, and a lot of cracking that needs to occur to actually release that, um, release that tension. So as you can see here, the, the cracks here are fairly evenly spaced because it just divides up that shrinkage um, over, the, over the length of the element. Um, they usually propagate from the restraint, but they're usually through the structure. So that crack that you can see on the surface will be the same thickness all the way through, but it might be variable thickness as you go up the element. So they're the sorts of things to look for with thermal shrinkage cracking. The last type, and I'll just mention it briefly, it's crazing. So this is something that you can see on the surface usually occurs due to overworking of the concrete, high winds across the surface, forms a crust, and that crust just breaks up. It's usually very shallow, um, the effect of that, and typically less than five millimetres depth. So it, it looks unsightly, but usually has minimal impact on the actual integrity. <clears throat> and this is just a summary um, of the different types of cracks and when they occur and the types of patterns that you might see. Excuse me. So th these presentations will be available to download, but I've just summarised there pretty much what we've just spoken about. So the type of cracking, structural, plastic, plastic settlement, drying, thermal cracking, when you might see it, type of pattern and the depth. Reason this is important is because these are the questions that you'll ask when you go out onto site or when you see your own structure. When did that crack appear? Did it appear within the first 24 hours? Did it appear after 28 days? Or you know, did it appear after I loaded the structure? What type of pattern is it? And then from that, we can work out what type of repair method we might be looking at. So the other question that very rarely gets asked is, why do we repair concrete? And it seems like such an obvious question, but when you really think about it, the answer is not so simple. So there are usually three reasons why you might repair concrete. And the first one is aesthetics. So we usually repair concrete because it looks bad. You know, the contractor doesn't like walking out onto site and seeing his concrete cracked. He wants to see it fixed and he wants, doesn't want, you know, the asset owners and other people using the structure to come in and see these, these cracks. So, you know, for aesthetics reasons, also because of safety and slips and hygiene, you don't want cracks and water coming through. So even though everything else might be okay about the structure, you just want it to look better. So that's, that's the first reason. The second reason, and probably in my opinion, the most important is because of corrosion protection. So this is all about the durability of the reinforcement. You're sealing against water and oxygen replenishment in the cracks, so you're stopping that water coming in, bringing oxygen in and causing that corrosion. And you're trying to protect the structure. You're trying to protect the services within the building and the fittings, because obviously they're gonna corrode if water comes in. And you're trying to restore and maintain that alkalinity in the concrete so that it can protect the steel reinforcement. And what we don't want is things like chlorides and sulfates coming into the concrete and then attacking that steel reinforcement. The idea of the concrete is to protect the steel. The steel on its own is gonna corrode. So if we don't protect it, then the structure is not gonna last long. If you want a 100 year design life or 150 year design life and beyond, then you're gonna to need to make sure that the concrete is doing its bit, it's maintaining alkalinity, and it's not allowing the moisture and air to get in in a way that's gonna degrade the steel reinforcement. So corrosion protection is a really important one. The third one is structural remediation. So there may be areas within the structure where cracks might occur and there may be a need to actually remedy those cracks so that the structural integrity is maintained and replaced. It's actually a bit, a bit of a complex area, this, uh, and I won't go into all the details of it, but cracks usually occur in areas of tension when you go and re-inject those areas of tension, the tension could reapply itself and actually open up and the crack could occur adjacent to that crack that's already been repaired. So it doesn't really work that well in an area of tension. In an area of compression, then injection would work, but then you've got to ask yourself, why is there a crack if you're in an area of compression? So a little bit of complexity there. Um, you know, concrete is designed to have zero tensile strength anyway. So trying to inject to restore tensile strength isn't really important. If you're injecting to maintain um, the protection of the steel, then yes, that's corrosion prevention, but for structural remediation, doesn't really make a lot of sense. So rebonding of the concrete typically isn't effective for injection. So again, just summarizing uh, the three 
um, reasons why you might inject concrete. So the first one is aesthetics, the second one is corrosion protection, and the third one is structural remediation. And then underneath that, you've got all the reasons. So, you know, does it look unsightly? Are you trying to seal against water and oxygen? Are you trying to rebond cracked concrete? You know, why are we actually doing this? And then that act will help us determine what type of product to select. Let's have a look at the crack repair materials that are available to us because this then using the information that we've just put together based on you know, the type of cracking and why we're doing this, we'll be able to decide what type of resin we, um, we might use. So the, the type of resin as we've discussed will depend on crack movement, the crack width, the repair objective. You know? So what are those th three things um, and what are the answers to those? And then we'll be able to select a material from that. So crack injection uh, resins, uh, you would have seen, you know, there's epoxy resins, which are generally used for structural and aesthetic reasons. There are hydrophobic um, polyurethanes, which are high foaming and are used for water stopping. There's hydrophilic PUs um, that are used for leak sealing. There's microfine cements, which are good for corrosion protection. There are acrylic gels. All of those types of resins have different viscosities and different penetrability, um, different flexibility, uh, you know, and a lot of different features that might determine how and why you use them in, in different areas. I'll just um, quickly explain the difference between a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic resin. So a hydrophilic resin will react with water. It'll form a solid compound, but then, then that solid compound becomes hydrophilic, which means that it'll actually expand and contract with absorption of moisture. The reason that's important is when you inject it into a crack or a, a a joint or a defect, um, it'll go in, it'll seal that crack. And then when it comes in contact with water after it's cured, it'll actually expand and create compression in that crack. And that compression will seal against water and air getting in um, you know, during the, the lifetime of the structure. So it's, it's a bit of a live resin. It's expanding and contracting um, as needed. And therefore it's gonna tolerate things like uh, live cracks a little bit more because it'll expand as the crack opens, for example, and contract as the crack closes. A hydrophobic resin, uh, it'll react and it'll um, form a completely stable compound. Usually it has very high bond to the concrete, um, higher strength properties usually, depending, um, but it won't absorb moisture. So resins such as epoxies and polyurethane are hydrophobic. They form a resin, they then repel water, they stop the water coming in but not as tolerant for moving and live cracks. So product selection uh, will come down to a, a few things. Um, so wetness, so when you have a high flow of water, you need a fast reacting resin to prevent washout. So it has to react fast, bond to the surface and stop that water from coming in. Epoxies typically have higher bond where the concrete is drier. So an epoxy is used for a dry crack. Um, polyurethanes will bond to a well to a wet surface. Um, when you look at movement during surface, epoxies are very stiff. They don't absorb much movement, but polyurethanes will have greater flexibility, particularly the uh, hydrophilic ones, as we spoke about, because they'll actually expand with the crack. The width of the crack becomes important. You usually want a thicker resin in a wider crack, a very low viscosity resin, very, very fluid in a narrow crack. And then, you know, the pumps and exit available to you will also determine what you use. If you don't have the expertise needed um, for a three component product, then obviously you're gonna be looking at a, a single component product. So things like that, these are all the types of things that you'll be considering um, during your product selection. And then the crack width, just to look at that in a little bit more detail, um, a crack of less than about 0.2 millimeters is very difficult to inject. It usually requires uh, a very low viscosity resin um, and extremely high pressure. The crack is barely visible anyway, and in most cases it would be self-healing. And as we said, you know, up to 0.3, it's going to protect the steel anyway. So why are we injecting it is, is the question. So typically below 0.2, we won't go looking to inject that type of crack. 0.2 to 0.7 is a pretty common range for cracks. They often occur in this range. It's a little bit just outside the, the minimum specification requirements. So we need a low viscosity resin. You know, 200 centipoise is, is usually desirable or less. 
um, and reasonably high pressure as well. So you'll be looking at electric diaphragm pumps rather than a hand pump for that, for example. When you get to 0.7 to one millimetre, you can go a slightly higher viscosity. Um, it's usually easier to inject. The cracks are very visible. And usually once you're getting to that thickness, you're actually looking to need to inject those cracks um, to prevent corrosion. One millimetre or greater becomes a slightly different problem. The, the crack is typically at that point so wide, you want to stop the resin from flowing through and just leaking out the other side. So then you have to take measures, either by selecting a, a slightly more viscous resin or sealing the bottom of the crack as you're injecting. So, you know, these are the things to consider with the different crack widths. This is only a guide only. It's, it's a rule of thumb. It's not a precise science. Just a word on, on penetration of resins though. Um, I just wanted to point out the relationship between the flow into a crack and the pressure applied versus the width of the crack and the viscosity. So um, common thought is that if you lower the viscosity, you're gonna have more penetration, which you do to some extent. Um, if you increase the pressure, you're gonna have more penetration, you do to a greater extent. Um, if the crack is wider, of course, you can have a much greater penetration. If you just look at the Navier-Stokes formula here, which I've just got at the top of the screen there, Q is the flow rate. And then the formula um, that we've got for flow in a, between two plates is you've got P squared, which is pressure. So if we double the amount of pressure, we're going to have four times the flow. If the crack is twice as wide, we're going to have eight times the flow because it's to the power of three. If we halve the viscosity, it's, it's only a, a doubling of the penetrability. So increasing your pressure is going to have far more impact than lowering your viscosity. But you can only increase your pressure to a certain point before you potentially cause damage to the structure. So it's all a balancing act to get it right. But that's just the relationship. And it's important to recognise that when selecting your type of resin. So just going through some crack repair um, methods and equipment, water stopping PU resins, very high foaming. They're suitable for ground consolidation. They have a very fast reaction with water. Um, crack sealing injection resin properties are usually more flexible, low foaming. Um, we don't want a lot of bubbles in it. We want a nice solid resin. Um, they're used for crack injection and long-term sealing. So some of the injection methods you might use, you can use in a wide crack, um, gravity. Um, feeding. You can use surface mounted injection packers, which you can see in item A there, um, or you can use high pressure injection, which you can see in um, figure B there, um, which is the packers um, on the surface on one side and then drilled in on the other side. So the types of injection packers you might use, they could be surface mounted, as you saw in the previous slide, or they could be knocking, which is that bottom grey um, packer there. So you drill a hole and knock that in um, just with a hammer. Um, or they could be mechanical screwing, which are the top two packers. And that's that rubber valve that you see at the top. As you tighten the, um, the head of that packer, that rubber valve expands, seals against the hole, and then allows you to inject um, into the hole. And you have various types of heads on those packers. So in one photo, you can see the nipple head on the left-hand side, and the other one, you can see the clutch head uh, on the right-hand side. So different types of packers available, which can be drilled into um, your structure, and then you can inject through. Starting with the, um, the type of equipment, it, there's a few different types. So there's the, the gravity injection tool, um, which is just a, a, a common source bottle, um, basically. Um, we have dual cartridge guns and injection pumps, and you know we like to refer to it as our, um, as our tomato source bottle. You can fill that in, and we'll show you how you use that in a moment, um, which is probably the easiest type of injection uh, you can do. So um, the other types of injection equipment, low pressure injection, just that handheld cartridge gun, um, you can usually only get about six to eight bar of pressure uh, using one of those. In the middle, you can see a small injection pump with high pressure, low volume. And then on the um, right hand side there, you can see a large injection pump with high pressure and, um, and low volume. Um, that's typically good for um, where you have water stopping in an underground structure and you need to get lots of resin in fast. So back to the source bottle, gravity filling. Um, you'll all remember that one now. Uh, horizontal surfaces, the gravity method is really easy. We're basically veeing out the crack, we're chasing the top of it and we're just pouring the resin into it and we're allowing the resin to flood into the crack and we're just repeating that until the crack is filled. So this is for cracks where you have a width of you know, 
one millimeter plus where the resin is going to soak in easily. You have low viscosity, really easy to do. You can come across later, grind off the surface and it looks good. Um, and it's really easy for anyone to, to do. So this is the simplest form of crack filling. The second type is the surface mounted packer, which we've um, seen a moment ago. So this is for vertical or horizontal um, surface cracks. We usually be out the top of it. We clean the crack with air and water. We place the surface mounted packers across the top, which you can see there in the, um, in the diagram. We then use an epoxy paste across the top of the length of the crack. And then we inject a low viscosity resin in through those packers to, to fill the crack. Very labor intensive, this one, but um, quite simple as well. Not, not so complicated, as long as you know how to mix resins and, um, and have some of the basic skills required for, for using these types of products. We then have pressure injection, which is um, typically the most common type of, of resin injection. What we'll be doing here is we drill a hole into the structure and we try to intersect the crack roughly at the, at the mid depth, as you can see in that diagram there, in that front packer, the hole goes through at 45 degrees. We've moved about hundred millimeters away from the crack and we've drilled in at an angle to intersect that crack roughly at the, um, at the mid depth. We can apply an epoxy um, paste at the surface to stop the resin coming through if we want. If we don't need to though, it's much better not to because then you can see the resin coming through. So it just depends on the application um, situation whether you do that or not um, and then you inject using pressure pumps and low viscosity resins to, to fill that crack. Just um, a few short notes on water stopping. So this is typically in an underground situation very commonly particularly applies to, to Singapore a lot because I know you have a lot of TBM tunnels which are segmentally lined as you can see in the photo there um, where you might have high pressure and water flowing in and you'll need some way of sealing that high pressure water. And that can apply to pile walls, rock faces, and other underground structures where you have really high pressure coming in and you need to stop that water. And just to give you an example um, of that, we've got a little video here that shows you the type of um, high pressure water you might be faced with. You can see there, you know, we're, we're under about 40 metres of, of water there, um, below Sydney Harbour in that one actually. And you can see the water just off to the side of the applicator there that's coming through that joint. And that's what we're actually trying to seal. So we're going to be, through that packer is just installed, we'll be injecting a very fast um, setting resin. So that will foam and start reacting within about 10 seconds and it will form a structure within one to two minutes. And as we're injecting that, you'll be able to see that leak um, seal almost instantaneously. We were out of there um, within less than an hour. It's drilling one hole, injecting the resin, sealing that up completely, and then being able to, to walk away. But it's, it's really critical to have the right type of resin for that type of application. It has to be fast reacting and it has to form a structure very quickly as well. And you need the right size pump to be able to get the volume of resin that you need in there fast enough. So these are the types of things you might be faced with. So just in summary, uh, you know, really important, as I pointed out, probably the key thing that gets missed is establishing the reason for injection before we start. So is it aesthetic? Is it for corrosion protection? Or is it structural? We have to understand the type of cracks and the cause, and then we have to select the right materials and methods for the work. So understanding all of those things will help us select the right me methods for, um, for concrete repair. And I hope that gives you a nice little introduction into, um, into concrete repair. Probably not as practical in terms of the injection part as you, you might um, like to hear, but we'll be covering things like that in the future. This is just a little introduction. So thank you for that. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the group chat. Otherwise, I've got my email address there on the screen. Feel free to, to drop me an email um, at some stage. Cool. Okay, I've just seen a question come through there, just as I've said, do you have epoxy wet crack repair material from Alex Boone. So um, Alex, some epoxies will work with wet cracks. They're not the most effective way to inject a, a wet crack because the bond isn't as great with an epoxy as it would be with a polyurethane. I guess the question is, why do you want to use an epoxy rather than a polyurethane? Um, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss that um, 
separately if you'd like to, to drop me an email on that and we can get in contact and, and maybe Celia from Quickseal can be in, in contact with you as well um, about that. Okay, I might, um, might end that there. Thank you very much for joining us, everyone. I look forward to, uh, to seeing you tomorrow.